But Paul gives another option, and an option that most people overlook. I'm going to go into some areas that maybe you've not thought of or you've not seen in Scripture before. And again, the intention here is not to give you options. <laughs> I'm not here this morning to give you options and say, oh, now I got some more options to get divorced. That's not what I'm giving you. The intention is not to give you options, but rather to provide reasonable accommodations and safety for spouses. Now you need to hear what I'm saying. Well, First Corinthians reasonable. chapter 7, I want you to look at verse 12, the next verse, and look what he says. He says, to the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as, but as it is, they are holy. But if the believer, if the unbeliever, watch this, now here's the key. If the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. Hmm. Highlight that in your Bible. If the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister, watch this, is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. Now, I know what some of you are saying. Pastor, I don't have no peace in my house. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Well, you know, Pastor, he gets on my lap. No, no. Look at what Paul is writing here. And let me, let me go back up because I know we read some things that may be questionable. And let me just say that up in verse um, 14 where he talks about the believing spouse sanctifies the unbelieving spouse. Let me just say what he is not saying, what he is not saying is that if you have an unbelieving spouse, that your spouse, be, that unbelieving spouse becomes saved because of you. That's not what he's saying. No, I, it, it, I mean, you, you may think it's funny, but there's a lot of people that read that and they go, well, he's covered or she's covered. She's going to be saved. She's going to be in heaven because I, they're sanctified through me. No, no. What he's really saying is that when you live in a house where there's one spouse that's saved and one spouse is not, that spouse that's not saved and all the children in that house all receive are beneficiaries of the blessings that come through that saved person. Look what he says down in verse 15. Verse 15. If the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. Paul first starts with the very best scenario. And the very best scenario is that the unbelieving partner is still willing to stay in the marriage with their believing partner. That's the perfect scenario. And then the Bible says, if that is the case, then stay and rejoice and enjoy. And if you're here this morning or you're listening or watching or whatever, and you're in that situation, what the Bible teaches is that if your partner is willing to stay with you, even though you're a believer, then thank God and keep moving forward. Continue in your marriage and, and watch this. And while you are continuing to that saved spouse, be the best saved spouse that you could possibly be to your unsaved husband or wife. Amen. Amen. Be the best evangelist that you could ever be. Best now, that doesn't that mean that you can be. But look at verse 15 again. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. Now, in addition to immorality, we now have two. Everybody say two. two. We now have two grounds, legitimate grounds for a divorce. Jesus said immorality, sexual immorality. Paul added to it and said, yeah, but if you also have an unbelieving spouse that's not willing to stay with you, let him go. Let her go. So now we have two. And it's called abandonment. 
when you abandon someone because of what they believe and you don't want to be with them anymore, and that's why he says you should live in peace. You can't force somebody to be with you if you're serving God and they don't want to serve God. You can't force them. And so God says you should live in peace. He says don't try to hold them back. If they want to go, they don't like who you're serving, they don't like the fact that you're worshiping, they don't like the fact that you love God, they don't like the fact that you have a God that's different than theirs, he says let them go. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, it is so important that when we do this thing that we do the homework up front so that we select the right person. Are you still right. with me? It's so important. Abandonment comes in different forms. Because immediately when you and I think of abandonment, the first thing that we think of is the physical leaving of a person. It's when I say, I'm going to abandon you. I'm going to walk away from you. I'm not going to be near you. I'm going to move out of the house. I'm going to go to another state. I'm going to disappear and you'll never see me again. I'm going to go to a different country. I've abandoned you. Where is Mark? I don't know. I haven't seen him in six months. He's abandoned me. But abandonment comes in different forms. We think of the physical leaving, but it could also mean forsaking your role. Watch this. Stay with me. It could mean forsaking your role as the husband or as the wife. When I say, you know what? I'll stay in the house, but I don't want to be a husband anymore. And I'm going to go about and I'm going to do my own thing. You sleep upstairs. I sleep downstairs. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go out. I'm going to party. I'm going to club. I'm going to have me a girlfriend on the side. I'm not supporting the household anymore, so I'm not bringing any more money into this house. I'm not going to pay the mortgage. I'm not going to pay. That, that's all on you. I have now abandoned, watch this, I have now abandoned my role as the head of the house. Here, we know what that means. But what even if you have a believing spouse? Because that's the question. Pastor, my, my husband, he, he, you know, my, or my wife, Pastor, she, she, she claims Christ. She's a believer. She, she says that she follows Christ and she knows Christ. Well, suppose you have a believing spouse who abandons their responsibility to the marriage. Now, what does that look like? Pastor, what does it look like when you say abandon your responsibility? Well, let me give you some examples. Suppose your spouse, husband or wife, is a drug addict. And so all the money that you would use to pay the bills, to pay the mortgage, to keep the lights on, to put food on the table for the kids is all going to the drugs. And, and maybe as a result of some of the drugs and the activity that surrounds the drug, there are strange people coming to your house. There are strange people around your house. And maybe it's now causing a safety issue or a safety problem for you and for your kids. That's an abandonment. Maybe your husband or your wife is addicted to gambling and all the money used to, for the house, all of his or her paycheck is going to the casinos. It's going to, uh, what's that place? Choc Choctaw? Choctaw. Choctaw, right. Right. It's all, it's all going up there. And he or she is taking trips up there once a week and blowing the whole paycheck. Or maybe he or she is borrowing money from others to go gambling because it's an addiction. And because he or she is not paying it back, now all of that funds, all of the money, people are coming after your husband or after your wife. And so they're, they're, swing, they're driving by the house, checking to see when you're there. That's, that's a safety issue for you and for your family. Suppose they start shooting. Suppose you go to the store and they stop you and they threaten you. That's a safety issue for your family. Suppose your husband or wife refuses, especially for the husband, refuses to say, and I gave this example earlier, and says, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to work, but the money's going in my pocket. I'm not paying any bills here. I'm not helping. I'm not paying the mortgage. I'm not paying no bills. I don't, I'm not, don't ask me for nothing. You're on your own. That's an abandonment of your role as a husband, as a husband. If you and I look a little bit more intently at the scripture, look at what the Bible says, Romans chapter 7, I think it's going to come up on the screen for you, verse 1. 
and I want you to read just to show you, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Look at what Paul writes. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to give you an example here. Now, hold on, because this I need you to go, you're going to need to pay attention to get this. Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? Stay with me. Watch this. For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. Now, let's just stop right there. Everybody understands that, right? If you're married, if a woman is married or a man is married and the spouse passes away, that man or that woman is free to marry again. She, she or he is no longer bound in marriage to that person because they are what? Dead. Watch this. Verse 3. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. Makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense, right? Here's the key, and this is important. You and I must understand that spiritual death is just as real as physical death. Let that sink in. Spiritual death is just as real as physical death. So when we read that, when we, when we read what we just read in Romans chapter 7, when we read that, we go, yeah, pastor, that, that's, that's a no-brainer. It makes sense. Yeah, if, you know, if my husband die or if my wife die, I'm free from the law that bound us as husband and wife, and I can go and get another wife again, or I can go and get another. I get it. He's dead. She's dead. But when the Bible talks about death, it's not just always physical. And I'm going to prove it to you by looking at verse 4. Look at verse 4. Look at what he says now. We just read verses what? 1 through 3. But look at verse 4. I love context. Love the Bible, right? Look at verse 4. He says, so my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law. Stop right there. When you died to the power of the law, did you die physically or spiritually? Uh-oh. So he's giving you the example. He's telling you. This is not physical. Right. It's not just physical. Right. The verse right after that, he says, let me, let me give you an example. When you died and we were all, we're all dead to the law, he's not talking physical. He's talking spiritual. Watch this, verse 4. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ, and now you are united with the one who has raised you from the dead as a result we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. Watch this. The death Paul is talking about here is spiritual, not physical. It includes physical, but it doesn't exclude spiritual. Spiritual. So what Paul is teaching us here is that death, watch this, death breaks the covenant of marriage. Death breaks the covenant of marriage. And when I say that, immediately our minds say, yes, somebody dies physically, I'm out of the covenant. But now that you understand that death is both physical and spiritual, when I say death breaks the covenant of marriage, now you begin to think. Because you could be physically alive and spiritually dead. Oh, y'all not with me this morning. This is, this is, this is good word. <laughs> Even if I must say so myself, the Bible is just so wonderful. You can be physically alive and spiritually dead. I'll give you another example. Before you became a Christian, you were physically alive, but you were, phys you were spiritually what? There you go. So when we understand death, and we understand it in the context of marriage, now let me, let me pull it all back together again. Because death breaks the covenant of marriage. And in the area of spiritual death, 
spiritual death can also, not just physical, but spiritual death can destroy a marriage. So now the question becomes, I know what you're thinking, because I I can hear the the grinding of the gears in your mind. (laughs) You're thinking, okay, pastor, so what constitutes spiritual death? Because maybe I'm in a situation where my spouse, my wife, My husband is spiritually dead. Well, at the end, we're in Romans chapter 7. At the end of Romans chapter 6, and you all know this verse, verse 23, he ends that chapter, that chapter ends by saying, for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We all know that passage of Scripture. So Romans 6 ends, and immediately it goes into Romans chapter 7. And by the way, by the way, just so that you know, the Bible and the text, the words of the Scripture are inspired by God. The chapter breaks are not. Right. Right. So somebody came in later on, not necessarily inspired. So you will find a lot of places in Scripture where there is a chapter break where there shouldn't really be a chapter break because it's one continuous letter. So in Romans 6, 23, he says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So sin brings spiritual death and sin brings, can bring physical death. But now I want you to look at verse four of that chapter six. We looked at verse four of chapter seven. Look at verse four of chapter six. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Let me tell you what Paul is saying here. He's saying that spiritual death to one covenant allows a remarriage to another covenant. This is good. He just said, you died to the law. You died to the old covenant. Look look at it again, verse 4. For we died and were buried with Christ. We were dead to the law. We died to the law. He says, you were dead by baptism and, and buried with Christ in baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we may also now live new lives. When you have a spiritual death to one covenant, it allows remarriage to another covenant. We had a spiritual death to the law, and it allowed a remarriage to a new covenant with Christ that brings life. Now, we're talking spiritual, not physical, death. Spiritual, spiritual. And Paul's reference to death is very clearly both physical and spiritual. And spiritual. So putting all that together, it helps you and I to understand that in a marriage relationship, You can be in a situation where your spouse is living physically, but spiritually disconnected, spiritually, watch this, dead, where they have removed themselves from their responsibilities as the spouse. And when that happens, that's where you get what I call, I call it the four A's. It's really only two. It's really immorality uh, or adultery and uh, abandonment. But under abandonment, I put in parentheses that it also includes abuse and addiction. Because when you are an abuser, you've removed yourself. You're spiritually dead. You've removed yourself from the responsibilities of covering and protecting and providing for your family, whether you're the male or the female. When you are addicted, you have removed yourself from the responsibility of covering and caring and protecting and providing for your family. Now, I'll tell you why this is tricky and it's hard. 
because you may be in a situation, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, you may be in a situation where you have a spouse who is addicted to something. I'm not saying that you should get divorced. I'm not saying that you should run out and take the words of this sermon and get a divorce. What I am saying is that you must be safe and you may need to get separated. You may need counseling so that you can restore and reconcile with the grace and the repentance and the love and the favor of God coming into your relationship that you can reconcile if your spouse is willing. Amen. That's always the number. That's always paramount for God. We can read all the text and look at all the scripture and look at all what Paul says, but the bottom line is that if your spouse comes to you and he or she is repentant and says, I want to make this work, you should allow him or her that opportunity. And sometimes, depending on your unique situation, it may mean allowing them to make that opportunity happen outside of the house. Now, let me tell you very clearly, and I'm almost done, what, is, what Paul is saying. I want to tell you what Scripture is saying, and I want to make sure that you understand what Scripture is not saying. What Scripture is saying is that spiritual death in relation to marriage is much broader than sexual immorality and abandonment. Spiritual death is much broader much broader than sexual immorality and abandonment. And I gave you some examples. There's addiction and there's abuse. Let me tell you very clearly what Scripture is not saying. I don't want you to run away with this and misunderstand. It is not giving you or I or anyone liberty to find a new way out of the relationship that you hadn't thought of before. This is not a way out. And I don't want you to go home and pick on your husband and make him abuse you and go, see, Pastor, he did it, I'm gone. Now, we've got to be careful because it's easy for people to hear this and go far beyond what God is desiring to be said. This is not time to find a way out of your relationship, but it does bring correction, and it does bring liberty for spouses that over the years, and I've seen this, and maybe some of you have seen this, and maybe you've even been a part of this, spouses, men and women over the years that have endured incorrect, incorrect counseling and advice from church leaders. And somebody say, Pastor, what do you mean? Because I've seen it where a woman would come to church and she's black and blue. And she would go in and talk to the pastor and the pastor would say, well, did he commit adultery? No. Well, you need to go back home. Wrong answer. That's the wrong answer. That's wrong, wrong. But yeah, but pastor, he didn't commit adultery. I don't care because you don't understand Romans chapter 7. And you don't understand 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's not a safe environment. They have abandoned, they have abandoned their place, their role as the husband. And I've seen this growing up in the church. And it was always something that was swept underneath the rug and nobody wanted to talk about it. Why is sister so-and-so wearing glasses? Why is she wearing sunglasses and it's dark outside? Why is she wearing sunglasses inside the sanctuary? Because she got a black eye. You know why? Because her husband punched her out. And we keep, and she would go and talk to the pastor. And the pastor, and if you're watching this and you're hearing this, I'm, I'm, I'm repenting on behalf of every pastor because we're not perfect and we don't know everything. But it was wrong. And it was simply because we didn't understand the scriptures. And that's why we teach line by line. That's why we do it, so that we can have a better understanding of what scripture says. So I, apology is not enough. I feel for those women and even for those men that were in situations where they got the wrong advice. And where we maybe should have separated them and we maybe should have held them accountable. We had a situation. Three areas, and I'm, then I'm done. Three things where a divorce is permissible. Number one, in the area of immorality and adultery. Number two, abandonment by a non-Christian. And here's the other area that most people don't know that we just talked about. Number three, number three, when a person is living in the realm of death and it has been recognized and confirmed by the church.
God takes marriage seriously and you can't dissolve a marriage until death occurs whether it's a spirit a physical death or spiritual death did y'all learn something from this this morning this has been enlightening it should be because maybe you've got a friend out there or maybe you've got a a cousin or an auntie or an uncle a family member who's going through some stuff again this is not for you to take and say ooh you need to go on YouTube and look at my pastor's sermon today and you need to go talk to a lawyer it's not what I'm saying what I am saying is that if you find yourself in this situation, I do not want anyone to ever use the excuse that, well, she didn't commit adultery, so I guess I still gotta stay with this abuse. Or he didn't commit adultery, so I guess I still gotta deal with his uh, drug addiction. Because you don't. And the next step may not necessarily be a divorce, and I would hope that it wouldn't be a divorce, but the next step would be counseling or maybe separation or accountability or whatever it takes and the church is here to be that area of accountability that's what the Bible says in, in, in Matthew 18 that the church is there for it's the area of accountability so when that's a sensitive came. area but I want us to do it under the grace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ amen father we love you what a subject for a Sunday morning <laughs> it's not something that's gonna make us shout 